Hello, everyone. Welcome here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And we're joined by our friend Dave all the way from somewhere in the Netherlands. Where, where exactly, Dave? I'm uh, close to Arnhem at the moment, uh, close to Germany also. So, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, indeed. Yeah. 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 And so we were just um, just chatting. This is a really fast moving topic that we're we're going to tackle this morning, and uh, yeah, and that safe. I'm sure, like all of us, we're we're really working to understand and how we can embrace this technology to, you know, take our business, make us all more efficient. Yeah, Dale and I have joked around and, and said um, things like, you know, Dale using generative AI is better than Dale without generative AI, right? Yeah. That, I think really strikes the point. Dale is still needed, right? The, the person driving it is still, is still needed to, you know, and we're going to talk, we're going to talk about, about some of that. So, yeah. yeah. So, Don, how hard was it when you, you, you were thinking back? The, the the complexity of learning how to use this tool is actually much greater than the previous tool I think of is when it, I'm old enough to remember the first calculator. Yeah. And there were a yeah. few things you needed to know with a calculator, but not yeah. too many. And some people use the reverse Polish notation calculators, yeah. but yeah. but there was only a handful of things and you could get fantastic results. That's this right. thing, it's still an, an uncharted field. And just yeah. before we went live, we were talking with Dave about uh, basically how to get the best results. And Dave, you want might want to say what you uh, what you were telling us. Yeah, well, the, uh, like I said, the prompt is very important, of course. Eh? So you can ask a question, but it's also it's always better to start the question by in what kind of role would you like Chat GPT to act? So in the role of, for instance, the Gartner consultant or the marketing assistant. So, yeah. so yeah. in your role as, it's almost yeah. like a user story. In your role as, and then a role. <laughs> yes. Give me yeah. advice. Write for me this and use. Yeah an upbeat language, use a strategic uh, yeah. vocabulary, use, yeah, just the prompt yeah. is so important. Yeah. 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 And Dale, um, Dale commented, we were talking about, you know, we've all been trained to have really short, like the, from Google, we would just pick up keywords, right? And then some of us old guys would, would, wouldn't even use the question there. We would just yeah. try to pick up all the keywords. And so, and so what were we talking about as far as prompts, Dale? Yeah. Just that you're rewarded in this new universe for being verbose and thoughtful in your prompt, as opposed to, as Don was saying, like I, I still was doing it last night. I was looking for sure. some ramps for uh, lifting cars up for doing work underneath them. And so I'm typing in wow. rubber car mat, you know, something like that. And it wouldn't occur to me to go to chat GPT and say, Hey, I have a machine shop and I want to raise a car and tell my story. And I'm looking to buy this. And the results I would get would be better in that yeah. case. Anyway. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started with introducing our presenters here today. So I'll hand things over to Chris. Yeah, so my name is Chris. I'm part of our customer solutions team here at Safe Software. So my role is really to help organizations make sure they're getting the most out of their FME licenses and their assets. So uh, here to give you some ideas for using the chat GPT functionality in FME. Dale, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Chris. My name is Dale Lutz. I'm one of the two co-founders of Safe, and I've been having a blast giving lots of thought uh, together with the amazing team at SAFE as to how we can best deliver value to all of you, our customers, using the new techniques that are available to us. Mm -hmm. And my name is Don Murray. I'm one of the two good looking guys on this call. Um, and I'm the other co-founder of uh, SAFE Software. With that, I'll pass it off to the other good looking guy, uh, Dave Lurie. We, it, they're easy, we're easy to get mixed up. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, the same haircut. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh... So my name is Dave. Uh, I'm uh, above all a techie, I would say, born with the talent to be curious and to wonder. Yes. I yes. started a career in software development, uh, databases, mm -hmm. memory caches and stuff. Mm. And then later got the chance to lead the GIS consulting company in the Netherlands. And yeah, haven't lost my curiosity for technology. So, mm -hmm. so here I am. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks everyone. So at this point, I'll get us all to turn off our webcam so that we can save on bandwidth for our upcoming demos. And I'll give a quick intro to our platform Livestorm if this is your first time using it. If you do have any audio or video issues, click that help button on the bottom left. It has four simple troubleshooting steps. Share your emoji reactions with us throughout the webinar with that react button on the bottom middle. And if you do have any questions throughout, 
please do leave those in the questions panel on the bottom right. We do have a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. If you do wish to download the deck, you can do so now, clicking the download button on the top right of the PDF here. All right, and with that, I'll hand things back to Don and Dale to go over our agenda. Sure, yeah, so I'll just go, we'll just rip through this quickly. So first we're just gonna do an introduction. Um, we know there's a number of folks here who aren't familiar with Safe for FME, so we'll go really quickly with that. And then we're gonna pass it off to um, our good friend, Dave, who's gonna talk about you know AI at Tensing. And then we're gonna get into some of the things we've been doing at FME. We'll show you some transformer updates. We're gonna show you a sneak peek of a generative AI reader which is really, really exciting. And then we're going to look at, you know, exploring, you know, what happens beyond open AI, open AI because of course, generative AI is a big, is a big and growing space. And then we'll do some sneak peeks on how augmented, um, sorry, generative AI can help us author workspaces really, really great. And then some resources and then some Q and A. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. It is. Yep. So introduction. Yes. Hey, this so, is yeah, our all new thanks. logo. It's our all new logo, which we love. Dale and I are so excited about it. It's um, bright, it's crisp, it's clean. And um, it uh, really takes us, you know, sets the stage for the next 30 years for safe software. Yeah. yeah. Where we're all about bringing life to data. And that's it's even more fun to do that with a little bit of help from generative artificial intelligence. Okay. That's kind of what we look like if you go to our site. Yep. And um, just some, we won't, we won't go through all these, but just for new, you can see we have, you know, 25,000 organizations around the world use us. We have, um, you know, 29,000, we have 200, 200,000 users. And so we're a global company and been around for a long time. So um, yeah, and um, we're really in the data integration space and um, our strength is spatial. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And here's, and, yeah. yeah, we, uh, pride ourselves on being able to be deployed pretty much anywhere that yeah. you want us to. We, we believe in data gravity and that your processing should be close to where your data is. Uh, we think that our tech tools give you amazing productivity and we're hoping that we can actually boost that with some of these techniques we're going to show today. And above all, we really do care about each of our customers and want to see them succeed. And that's yeah. why we've followed this restaurant model since the beginning of time. And Don, I see you've done some rentals to our restaurant. It looks pretty good. I definitely have. I definitely have. Thanks, Elizabeth, for, for doing that. And, um, and one of the big differences with SAFE between SAFE and all our competitors is SAFE software is not, for, is not the product. We are not doing all this to try to sell or market the company SAFE software for you know, whereas there's a lot of companies out there that are controlled by VCs where the whole point is to sell the company. That's why a VC buys a company because they try to sell it. And so we focus all our effort on the product and our team to provide the best product and the best support that we can. So that's a big differentiator for safe software. And you can tell that in the last one, you get it all. We don't nickel and dime you for different connectors. We give you every connector and as new connectors come out, you get them. We give you all the components and, um, and that also is a big differentiator, makes it really easy. You just buy the FME platform, you know, you get it all. There's not some hidden thing you're missing. So, yeah. And so over the years, yeah, this is sort of the history of the different types of data that we have yeah. supported. And uh, you can kind of look at that graph and follow it to the top and, uh, and see where we are today. But um, yeah. that's yeah. our history. Yeah, absolutely. Nobody touches the number of diff different data types. Yeah. Yes, we have supported. Somebody's asking about gaming. Uh, I think it was the Unreal Engine. There's a writer in FME that you can use to put data out into that. That's right. And we also did a lot of stuff with, um, um, oh, the blocks. Um, 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 Minecraft. Oh, yeah, Minecraft, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. And here's our platform with all the logos. And again, you buy the platform, you get it all. So, uh, yeah. And yeah, and this is super exciting. And um, the Gartner Magic Quadrant's coming out later this year. This is the Gartner customer choice. So this is all the vendors who are in our space. They, um, they get customers to, to express how they feel about the product. And Safe Software was, the, was the, basically the one in North America that, that was the top rank. So you can see who the other vendors are in, our, um, you know, in the space that we play in. So generative AI tech, our, this is our thesis statement, is that it is generating workflows across the knowledge-based industries. And 
We believe that FME makes it easy to apply the power of API-based generative AI to all data and systems. And we're gonna show some of this and we're gonna to go to the next slide here. We're gonna to try to show you how generative AI and FME makes new things possible. And to kick us off on that, we're gonna pass the torch to our friend Dave over at Tensing, who's gonna walk us through a case study about some of the things they've been up to and made available. So Dave, take it away. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dale. Well, on behalf of the Tenzing team, I want to share some of our R&D with you today. Uh, Tenzing is a consulting professional services company, part of the International Avignon Group, family-owned business. And in Europe, we operate under the, the Tenzing brand, uh, we specialize in data, geospatial data. So that's also what we're going to talk about today. And we help uh, organizations elevate their spatial intelligence. And we started relatively early with the use of AI in a geospatial context and have seen huge progress that has been made in recent years. Uh, those first machine learning and natural language processing projects in our R&D labs were great learnings. However, now leveraging modern AI like OpenAI, uh, integrating it into our workflows is giving us some amazingly new possibilities. And I have the honor to be here today, but I represent a lot of smart people from our company, my colleagues. Uh, they worked on these AI innovations and some of the work of, of Oliver, uh, David Eagle and Simon has been made public. And it all started early this year when Oliver created the first demo. It was an FME flow app that summarizes raw text. So for example, it could be used to create a summary of textual information stored against database records as part of a larger FME workspace. And then quickly a second demo followed. Uh, and that is an FME flow app that allows you to upload PDFs and then generate a summary that includes a summary text, keywords, locations, uh, even the detected language of the, of the document and geometric point locations in well-known text. And we've made some of that R&D publicly available on hub.save.com, where you can find our OpenAI ChatGPT summarizer transformers. And now I want to show you the use case using this technology of facilitating communication between different stakeholders in large organizations, large enterprises, and leveraging that capability of generating summaries of vast amounts of information and to do so, I want to use one of the best reading materials that's around. So let's summarize Safe's ebook, Spatial Data for the Enterprise for Dummies. It's an excellent read. It's over 40 pages long. So some stakeholders will want another way to consume it. Now, the app we will use is an FME Flow hosted instance, and we just need to upload the dummies book to the app. And once the file is available to the service, we configure some parameters so uh, that the app can email back the result. And then the service starts to read the PDF and the AI produces a summary of the document and sends it back. Uh, it sends it back by email. And that summary includes an overall synopsis and it also includes important keywords. So it starts with the overall synopsis. Then you see some of the keywords that are in the document uh, and we even configured it to detect the language. You can see here the language is in English and then a page by page summary of the document. Now, this type of AI approach is all about increasing the efficiency of exchanging information with different stakeholders, uh, stakeholders that need to analyze large volumes of detailed documentation and providing it to them in an accessible and comprehensive way. Now, taking this innovation a little bit further in our labs is the extraction of geographic information from maps, maps that are embedded in PDF documents. And the workflow you're looking at now, um, it allows us to extract this geographical context directly from a variety of maps that can be contained in technological and scientific documents, such as geological reports or scientific articles. And what we're doing here is using the FME platform as a glue that orchestrates this range of AI services like Microsoft Cognitive Services, Amazon Recognition, and OpenAI ChatGPT. 
So let's have a look what that, uh, what that actually does. Now, for the sake of the demo, we've, uh, we've prepared a single page document from a report that comes in PDF uh, format, and it has an embedded map. So we'll open the document here so you can have a look. And behind the scenes, FME reads this PDF and extracts the map that you're looking at from the document. And we send that map to Microsoft's computer vision service to check that it's actually a map. It looks like a map and not a picture of, let's say, a Dutch cow in a field. And we then send that image to Amazon Recognition and their service grabs the map labels and place names on the map with some OCR magic and turns it into text that we can use. And that text is then being sent to OpenAI uh, and we ask it to return to us the coordinates of those map labels, basically doing some geocoding there. And we stream back that map with some of the clickable labels exposed for you to interact with it. Now we're going to process another report that contains a more schematic and stylized map and again some more location information. Now if we open that document you see that the map looks a little bit different. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's a more stylized, uh, stylized map. Uh, again some location information of course you see here Robin Hood Airport, Nottingham. Um, uh, it's just to show that the tool can cope with low resolution cartographic maps, but also with more schematic and stylized maps. Now here you see uh, some, of the, uh, some of the responses again that, uh, that come from, um, from the FME Flow app. And we'd like to do some further testing. It's been a fun R&D project so far, and we encourage you to interact with it to see how it performs and so that we can refine it further. Now, to close off, uh, I'd like to say that we see a ton of opportunities, a ton of opportunities for ChatGPT, but also a ton of opportunities for FME flow combined with ChatGPT. And with the accelerated development, we feel that we've just scratched the surface in the past couple of years and look forward to what's to come next. Now, since ChatGPT is focused on natural language processing, its capabilities can be harnessed to support various aspects of geospatial workflows. And FME, of course, makes that possible by helping us to federate all those connections that we also saw earlier with all these different AI systems. Uh, enhancing data pre-processing, transformation, analysis, and visualization. ChatGPT can contribute to a more efficient and insightful geospatial data processing and decision-making process. Well, that's it for now. Let's, uh, let's go over to Christian. I think Dave just showed us a few ways that, um, you know, that kind of blow our mind on how easy it is to use, you know, you know, generative AI. So, uh, that was yeah, really cool. I mean, I, I know we've said often with FME that the only thing that limits you is your imagination and that's now taken to a whole new order of magnitude. And thanks Dave for kind of cracking that open for us and really seeing what, what can be done. It's pretty amazing. Perfect, great. Yeah, uh, I guess we can get, get going with the next section. So we'll start to talk about the updates to the OpenAI transformers that we initially created and released. I think it was around early January or, or late December when they actually got released. Uh, we did that webinar early on in the year. So what's changed since then? We'll see what's going on with the new transformers. So if this is your first time looking at the transformer parameters, this was the original look where we were only able to connect to the OpenAI service, and it was called the OpenAI Completions Connector. Uh, essentially, you had to provide your open API key, and then you could enter in your prompt, select your model, um, kind of all the basic uh, parameters that were available in the OpenAI authentication or OpenAPI uh, specification was available in this transformer. And since then, Azure has released that they have their own open AI, open AI of flavor. So you can actually authenticate using either service now. So you're able to provide your own open AI API key or your Azure open AI API key. Um, that is a mouthful to say. So I'm going to try to prevent <laughs> saying that from here on out. Um, but you can also provide your base URL. So that's specific to your Azure um, portal instance. Um, this just makes sure you're connecting to your Azure instance and not someone else's and not using the generic service from open AI. So, this also allows you to specify the API version. This is something that is mentioned in their documentation. 
Um, it's not something as simple as selecting today's date. There are specific API versions. Some of them are formatted slightly differently. So that is something that you'll have to refer to in the documentation if you're going to be using Azure OpenAI. Aside from that, um, yeah, what's going on? They've released GPT-4. So that model is available in both versions of this. So you can kind of specify which model you're using. Obviously, you'll have a bit more fine tuning abilities on the OpenAI side of things, but uh, you can kind of do some customization on the Azure side as well. So now we have support for both OpenAI and Azure AI. So again, just using that base URL and selecting the version. You uh, One difference between the Azure, op Azure OpenAI and original OpenAI is that with OpenAI, they specify the model names. So you're stuck with those names versus in Azure, which we'll see in a second here. Uh, you can deploy your own model name. So in this case, I'm using model GPT-4. That's not actually how it's written on the Azure portal side, which we'll see in just a second here. Uh, so you use a little bit different uh, naming convention there. If you actually jump into Azure portal just to see what's going on, uh, it's pretty simple to actually obtain your keys and your endpoints. So this is just under the Cognitive Services uh, Azure OpenAI resource. Uh, and then you can go down to the keys and endpoints. You, you have one of two keys. This is dependent on the instance. You can, of course, deploy multiple instances in the specified region that you'd like. I think this is primarily available in North America and Central Europe at the moment, um, but more more instances will be available um, as soon as Microsoft adds them. So that actually adds a really big benefit to using the Azure OpenAI service is that you can actually choose where the model is living. Um, and if you combine that with something like FME server running, or FME flow rather, running on that same uh, same data warehouse, then your, your job should process a little bit faster. So you have a little bit more flexibility running the Microsoft Azure OpenAI service. Obviously, that is dependent on your organization if you actually use Azure or not. So going back to the model deployments, on the model deployments tab, you'll see that there are the two options. So on the right-hand side, we have the model. That's the actual name from OpenAI. And then the model deployment name that is specific to Azure. So this is where you'll essentially grab that name. That's something that is user-defined. Um, in my case, I just use the same one, so I knew exactly what I was using. Um, but that's exactly what you would write into the transformers. And what else is new? So we've also, uh, since the original webinar, uh, chat GPT 3.5 Turbo has become publicly available and now GPT 4. Um, so we knew we have a new custom transformer for that as well, which is called the OpenAI Completions Connector. Um, and that allows you to do the chat completions rather than just the original completions. So this is a slightly different way of uh, inserting a prompt. It's, they're actually called messages um, into, into your OpenAI service. Um, in this case, you'll actually need to define a system um, prompt. So this is actually going to initialize the system, um, tell it what it's actually need, need to answer. So in this case, we're going to say, you're an AI assistant that helps people in, find information about FME. And then the user asks the question. So it's a lot more conversational. Um, the initializing message from the system is absolutely critical. And that's what uh, Don, Dale, and Dave were talking about earlier, where you can provide some context to what you want the model to actually output for you. So this is something that's kind of preparing the model for what answer needs to come back to the user. So this is a great, uh, great advancement um, with the AI model sets. So the difference between the chat completions and uh, regular completions, again, is that the original completions, they're Kind of more, they're more or less ready for consumption. Uh, you can fine tune them. I think that's more specific to the OpenAI service rather than Azure. I'm not sure if that's publicly available yet. Um, but again, that chat completion has those those three roles, and that would be the system to initialize or set the behavior of that model. The assistant would be the thing that actually answers, and the user is the person that asks. So very similar to that initial prompt that you were using previously in the original completions. And so all of this has been wrapped up into another custom transformer. So this is just using that OpenAI chat GPT connector. Um, it's exactly the same authentication uh, of type as the OpenAI completions connector. Obviously, it's formatted slightly differently because we're using messages instead of prompt now. So you'll have the ability to specify the role and the content, which in this case, we're doing from attribute values. Um, the one thing that I would note here is that group by is actually very important here uh, because you need to have something that actually combines those messages into a long thread versus writing a single prompt. So that's something that uh, we'll take a look at in a demo in just a minute here. Other than that, all of the parameters are pretty similar. I think the original completions connector has a, has a few more parameters. Um, and this is something that's just specific to the 
um, OpenAI API uh, method. So we'll see just a quick look at what actually what the custom transformer actually looks like. And inside of it, what's going on is since we can use that group by parameter, we're actually going to format the message for you. Um, and this will kind of take care of all the formatting uh, for the JSON, put it all into, into context for the model. So it'll put in that system message, it'll put in the user message, um, and then have it all pre-prepared for you in order to hit that API endpoint. So we'll take a look at what this actually looks like in action now. So we'll kind of compare and contrast the two transformers here. So with the OpenAI completions connector, this is typically done with just a single stream. Again, you're going to be using a prompt. In this case, I'm using an attribute value to fill that in. And we're just going to be asking for the top 10 businesses in the world. So in the um, in this case, it'll be running from a single stream versus the chat GPT connector is going to be using two streams where we actually have to initialize that data set or that model rather. And we're going to say it's a bot for getting a company profile and then have the user message or the prompt in this case. So uh, this is the actual question that we're going to be feeding in. Of course, that could be used uh, as a published parameter, but just with the demo, it's in an attribute value. And we can take a look at what's actually going on in the OpenAI complete or ChatGPT connector. So again, we're just grouping by that conversation ID. This is something that you can make up if you don't have a conversation ID already. You could just use a simple counter. Um, it'll just be used to aggregate those messages and then provide a response back in the proper format. The output of this, in this case, we're actually going to be fragmenting since we're asking for 10 features. We'll get 10 features back, and the result is going to be very similar between the two data sets. Uh, they'll see there's slight differences. I'll just pause that for a quick second here. Um, we'll see there's slight differences because they are different models. The top one, we were using GPT-4 versus in the OpenAI completion connector, we were using Text Da Vinci. So you can see in the um, visual preview, there's just some different formatting values. So we have 57.4 and the word billion versus the DaVinci one, it actually wrote out the whole number. So there's slight variations between the two. Uh, you can be explicit and ask for specific uh, format, formatted values back, but that's just something to be aware of. Right, Chris. So if I wanted to, um, like, let's say I had a bunch of data coming in and I wanted to ask, you know, the questions varied on, on different companies, then I, what I could do is use the OpenAI chat GPD connector, tell it one time with the system, oh, you are, you know, you are a marketing assistant, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then for as the companies roll through, I would be able to, you know, use the same chat ID and then just send all the messages um, as row by row into the open AI chat GPT connector. And it would have some, some context because it had the same chat ID. Did I get that right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's the benefit of it is you actually do have the ability to provide some context and essentially that would be like looping back in a sense. Um, so that would right. be providing the previous message history, which is kind of the benefit of using chat GPT versus just general completions is you can yeah. feed in a lot more. Uh, if I go back into those parameters, I think it's yeah. way back here. Yeah. I think it was right around here. You can actually have a lot more tokens available in the chat GPT connector. I think they yeah. have upped that to, I want to say it's, I'm probably going to get this wrong. I think it's in the 4,000s versus the okay. completions okay. connector is kind of limited to 2,000. Um, right. If someone in the audience knows, feel free to correct me in the chat panel there. Um, but yeah, you have the ability to feed in a lot more content into those messages and into those prompts, essentially. Okay. Good. All right. So at this point, I think I will hand things over to Dale, who's going to be talking a little bit about the generative AI reader. Yes. And I think you're going to run the slides for me, right, Chris? Yes. So this actually, uh, Don, actually, before we can hop back one, Chris, Don, do you want to set the stage for this? Because actually, literally, you saw this on a stage and we're, we're, we're uh, um, kind of inspired to suggest this it's safe, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I was at the Gartner show in, in Florida um, in uh, last month. And, um, and there was this, there was a lot of presentations I went to. And one of them was a vendor showing, you know, the generative AI reader um, like this. And, and the audience was blown away. And I was sitting there thinking, wow. That is actually very easy, and um, compared to other things we've done, it's safe. Um, I don't want to, you know, say that our, our team is our team's super skilled, but as we compared to other things we've done, it's safe. Like reading Revit, this is trivial, and um, and so I came back and I Dale and I talked and we said, well, well, let's do it. And so yes. here we go. 
So here we go. So yeah, the next slide then. Uh, and then after we were into this, I saw this tweet and I thought this is a good way to set this up. Is it yeah. fair to think of large language models or generative AI as a database with a natural language query interface instead of a SQL interface? And then the person asked, where does the database metaphor break? And, and Don and I talked about this. You can certainly do queries without mm -hmm. knowing SQL syntax of yes. what the language model knows, but you can't really update it. And mm -hmm. um, so, and then there's somebody else, uh, I got a little snarky one here as the next one. Is it fair to think of humans as a database with a natural language query interface? There's data, a query, and a result that you get from the data in the query, but where does the database metaphor break? And Donya, I think you said that sometimes humans can't be updated either. That's right, that's right, that's right. And like ChatGPT, you know, all of us have an uncle who no matter what question you ask him, he does have an answer. And uh, I've never had ChatGPT come back to me and say, I don't know. <laughs> it, you're gonna see Even it, the it, answer is, it should have said, I don't know. <laughs> you're going to see an example of exactly that bravado coming yeah. up. Don, Don's going to be impressed. So yeah, let's go yeah. to the next slide. So the team went away and created Generative AI Reader that but you can see the sort of parameters there. It asks you for, or you, you ask it for a list of items and that's the, the prompt. You just say, hey, uh, I wanna know all the top NFL teams or something like that. And it will look after creating the field names for you. I mean, if you want to, you can be more verbose and say, I want these field names, but hey, why would you? Um, because hey, we're lazy. And then it just generates you rows of data. So what it does for you compared to the stuff Chris was showing, um, in Chris's examples where you're chatting, you have more work to do if you want to get several things back from one prompt. We're kind of looking after that for you here. You ask for something that you expect many results from, and then it will give you those results. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about the interface. We also made the possibility to go between Azure as well as OpenAI, and we think that's important for the future. When you're in the Azure land, you once again have these deployments you can use and so on. And we think this is going to be even more useful when the AI being queried has your organization's data or has access to the internet. Uh, right now, these examples are accessing the known knowledge of the earth at some point in time in the past. So they won't change their answer really. And that's why we have the bottom thing there, use a cache because it's a little bit slow giving you the answer back. And if it's mm -hmm. if you're just asking something where you know you're gonna get the same thing every time, there's no reason to actually spend the money and do that query over and over again. However, someday when the AI has the ability to go out there and ask for things uh, via plugins maybe in the chat GPT universe, or perhaps you've seeded it with your own data and every night you update your sales records with your inventory or something, then you'll get more dynamic things back. So this is really a uh, proof of concept. It might already be a little bit useful, but bear in mind that it's only able to answer questions that it knows the answer to in a static way. So anything more you want to add to that part, Don? No, this is great, Dale. And uh, yeah, and I think it's important that Dale hit the important point is this is not, you know, this is sort of like Google Earth images. I remember people would go out and put their big sign on the roof and wondered why they couldn't see it on Google Earth. This is kind of the same thing. It's a snapshot in, in time. Yeah. Eventually, maybe it won't be, but today it is. So let's get the next slide and let's go through some examples. So here's a softball example. I don't know why you would actually do this, but okay, 10 popular children's names along with a corresponding nickname. I think someone in here in the chat said that they were using the um, this for, for naming their next dog. So this could be you know 10 popular dog names. And so you yeah. get a table of answers back and off you go. And it's nice to see Will in there. I think that's because of... Uh, Probably the new Picard episodes, Don, um, with Will Riker. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Clawing its way up to number three there. Exactly. Actually, my son was named after a Star Trek character, and I won't uh, get into that right now. So the next uh, slide we've got is starts to be a little bit of uh, FME flex, where we say all 50 U.S. states, their two-letter code, an example zip code, and the capital city. And what's this? I see a map because we did some prompt engineering that if we told the AI, hey, if there's any location at all that might be related to this, give us a point feature. And so this is us saying we, we're more than just a pretty table. We can also... Uh, together with our friend Chad GPT, get some locations. Now, all of it might be suspect, but nonetheless, yeah. it's given yeah. us something. Yes, yes. And so you can use this, Dale, really. Um, you can even use, you know, generative AI as a, you know, a fast and dirty um, geocoder, right? Yes, yes. yes. I, you know, again, someone will have to figure out how good it is, but, uh, yeah. but right. yes. So that's, that's this example. And so let's go to the next one here. Um, 
So now we start to say, okay, this is a little Canadian thing. All the CFL teams, their team name, blah, blah, blah. And the thing that just pops out, is there anybody on the line from Saskatchewan today? Man, you guys spend a lot going to football games and of uh, probably the least populated province in Canada. Well, at least by, by density of population, by area. And yet they have the highest average attendance. Isn't that what pops out to you, Don? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and anybody who's been to Regina knows the... Uh, you know, the Rough Riders, it, it's a big deal when they play. So it's a lot of fun to be in, in Regina when they're playing, for sure. Exactly. So I've done this with the NFL teams as well and learned a lot about my American geography. But now let's take a look at maybe combining these together. Let's go to the next slide. And, oh, no, here, oh, no, no, they didn't do that. I just, I don't know why I like Boise, Idaho. Is there anybody on the line from Idaho? Um, to kind of fact check this, I did some checks. I just said, hey, tell me the top... You see there the prompt I used. And again, I got some locations out of it. And based on a little bit of looking, this did seem, did seem right. And uh, I learned that uh, bodybuilding.com is actually a, a, an actual thing. And it's in uh, Boise, Idaho, Don. Did you know that? I knew about bodybuilding.com, but I did not know it was in Idaho, Boise, Idaho. So there you go. Yes. Yeah. So I thought, okay, that's kind of an interesting one-off kind of thing. And you can imagine, you know, even this doing some analysis, if you're planning a road trip to some place, you can start asking questions. And then let's go to the next one where I actually combine these all together. I use that query for the U.S. state names. And then I go into FME's feature reader using the generative AI reader feeding in the results from that first one. So for each of those 50 rows that I got on the first one, I go one at a time and say, give me the top 10 companies by revenue in that city and that state yeah. um, with the yeah. address. Da, 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 da. And um, yeah. yep. but, can I jump in there? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and Dale here shows how you can combine different um, queries together. But remember, the thing about FME is that first query could be coming out of your database. It doesn't yes. have to be a query you know, and FME supports more systems than anything. So it could, that could be coming from anything. And then you can use generative AI in the second feature reader to add more value. So yeah, really, really good. Now, the thing that you notice, um, I only got 490 rows out uh, through that, that port there. And why is it 490? Because one state, it refused to answer. And uh, the team and I dug in and it will not tell me this answer this question for Richmond, Virginia, it says there's a content filter being applied. So I don't know what kind of X-rated businesses there are in Richmond, Virginia. Anybody from Richmond, Virginia on the line? It absolutely refuses to answer this for Richmond, Virginia. So you just never know when the AI is going to be cranky. Huh, interesting. Yeah. So here you see some of the results we get and you can see um, the, the kind of... Uh, layout but but i noticed that delaware is like that don said about it about that uncle that doesn't know the answer and so in delaware it just made things up yeah if you look on the left company yeah. Yeah. a through j yeah yeah, yeah. so interesting wow yeah Maybe, that, maybe that's how they name. Maybe that's how they name companies in Delaware. Yeah, well, I know Delaware is where like a huge number of companies are incorporated. There might be so many that it just can't even yeah. um, cope yeah. with it. But, but yeah, this let's... really drives home the, what we're talking about, Dale, and that you, you know you need a person in the driver's seat, right? Um, yes. You just can't take the responses of this, um, you know, for verbatim because, um, yeah, it, it sometimes gives you goofy. What do they call it? They say it's hallucinating. Is that yes. the term they use? Yes. Yes, yes. And someone's asking how the results are geocoded. FME is just, we've prompt engineered this so that we tell the, the AI, hey, if there's a location, please give it to us. And then we fish that out and make the point feature. So yeah, let's go yeah. to the next slide here. So then yeah. um, putting it all together, I thought, well, with Chris, let's make an interactive HTML map for each city. And so let's go to the next. So uh, maybe actually hop it back one. Um, Chris, I'll just point out that I'm doing a little bit of geospatial processing. I'm getting for each city the convex hull because that's a nice old operation you and I did years ago, Don. Um, beautiful, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. And I hold the hulls to be coming at the ends at the bottom of the report. And then I use the HTML report generator and I get some HTML files, ones for each city. So let's hop yep. to Boise, Idaho, because that's where I like to go. And there you can kind of get a sense of where those businesses are. So yeah, so Dale did all this on form and, um, and so it works great. He could publish this to FME Flow and then a parameter could be, you know, you enter the name of any city in the United States and then you would get an interactive map being, being pushed through your, um, you know, your browser. So, and then you could have everybody in your organization using it. So it just shows how FME makes all this capability, you know, available to everybody in your organization who don't even know what's going on underneath, right? Yes.
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so the next slide actually drives home what Kyle's uh, asking. Uh, yeah. How do you know that it's not just BSing you? And I say here, you have to trust <laughs> with verification. Um, there is no way to know right now, um, at least with the technology that we have available to us, where it's getting this from. And so you have to, it's like a guess. It's, it's, you know, you have to do some testing yourself, but here yeah. is the map from Montgomery, Alabama, which I don't yeah. believe, Don. I don't think, do you believe these? No, no. I wish it, I wish it, when it didn't know, it would be like that uncle and say, oh, let me tell you, young grasshopper, and then tell you the story, because at least that prompt, that, you know, that prefix would tell you that it's, uh, it was making stuff up, right? So, yeah. So yeah. anyway, lastly here, uh, this reader is available on the safe labs. We're not going to say that it's fully supported by safe at this time, but if any of you want to grab it, you can go to uh, the hub. The link is actually uh, on this page or we can chat it out and you yeah. can download this thing. Look at that zero downloads last time I looked on, um, yeah, but, uh, yeah. but you can grab it, get yourself some keys and start playing around and having fun. Thanks Chris for doing that. And with that, I'm handing it off to Chris for, to take us home with some uh, other examples we've been playing with. All right. Yeah, so going beyond the OpenAI space obviously is a very exciting thing, um, but it's very limited to OpenAI. We're, we're more than just a single, <laughs> single uh, trick dog here, so we're going to explore beyond OpenAI. Um, yeah. So we took one, one small step and one giant leap AI for mankind. So what we're going to be doing here is just talking through how FME is really that... Uh, the vessel that allows you to connect to anything with an API very easily, very easily integrate your data with uh, AI services that are API based. So um, with FME, you can drive, let your data drive any generative AI service, similar to what Dale just showed there. Um, it can help you with any fine tuning ability if you need to feed in data uh, and prepare it for your model set. Um, FME can help automate the fine tuning of AI requests as well. So uh, that's something that's very helpful. On the generative side, obviously, if we can uh, send our information to the prompts, if you want us to do with the user parameter or send in your data, obviously, that's something that's very easy to do. Um, and on the other end, too, it's something that's very helpful for distributing the data. Um, again, it's not just a single pipe going into the AI. What are you going to do with the data after that? And FME has a lot of different options with what you can do uh, once the data has been processed by your AI. Yeah. So we're just going to talk really quickly about FME strengths here again. Uh, we have easy API integration with the HTTP caller transformer. So that's kind of the one transformer that allows you to connect to anything that has a REST or SOAP-based API. Um, very basic to work with. You can provide your uh, bearer API key, um, or token rather. Um, if you're doing web connections with OAuth, it's very easy to configure with web services and web connections. Uh, we have articles linked for all of these things in the slides. So that's what those underlined uh, texts are for. Uh, it'll give you information on how to actually configure all of these things. But what about once you're actually receiving the data back from the HTTP caller? We have a lot of different transformers that help you parse the response. If it's text-based, we have the JSON transformers. You can do things like format, extract values, fragment, flatten, uh, do whatever you need to do with the JSON. If it's raster-based and you need to do image processing, we also have trans transformers for that. So you have a lot of different flexibility uh, with what you actually want to do with the data coming back, back from your AI service. So this is where, again, Dale was kind of mentioning you're only limited by your imagination. And that has now been extended with use of API-based AI services. So one other system that we connected to that was AI-based uh, is the Leap AI connector. And of course, we have a couple of other AI-based uh, packages available on the FME Hub as well. Um, it was just to simply demonstrate how easy it is to configure these. So if we go into the next, uh, I think I'm actually in a couple of slides, I'll have a recording of going actually into the transformer. Um, and we'll, sh we'll just see how the HTTP caller will be looped back there, um, how the web connection works and everything like that. So all of this is really easily distributed um, on the FME hub. So this is something that can be, it's fully user driven. Um, our partners like Tensing um, have uploaded their transformers there. You can upload packages, uh, formats, and anything like that can go up onto the FME hub. Um, and this is just an easy way to share it with the greater FME community. So that's where you're seeing, we're posting a lot of these things to the Safe Lab uh, publisher. Here comes demo time. Okay, so we'll take a look at the Leap AI connector. Again, it's very similar to the OpenAI service where you, you feed in a, a prompt. Uh, that's just the image that we want to get back. In this case, I'm going to be asking for the FME lizard with the zipster toy, uh, and they're going to be on a hike in the mountains. And I'll edit the custom transformer just so we can see what's going on in here. The main transformer in this is the HTTP caller. And again, this is something that's just going to be used to interact with that Leap AI service. 
So we'll, we'll be creating an, a job essentially, and then we're going to loop back and check to see when is that job actually done. So we're simply just using a tester to see is the job status in progress or finished. And once it's finished, let's actually go and get that image um, and then see what the results are like in FME. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. So Chris, to be clear, a user doesn't have to dive in there, right? They just see, go to the show on the main screen, what they do, a user, they just exactly, drive yeah. up the leap AI. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So what we yeah. see right at the start here, um, yeah. you absolutely do not have to edit this or embed it into your canvas. Uh, all you have to do is Type right, in the Leap AI onto the canvas and then hit enter to add it to the to actually add it to the canvas. And then we'll go into those parameters. And then you just have to feed in your API key, spe specify the model, and enter your prompt for what you actually want to get the image back of. So yeah. Cool. And what does that picture look like? What does that picture look like at the end? That's the FME lizard. <laughs> yeah. Except I think it got a little confused. Um, I wanted it to be the FME lizard with the zipster robot. I think it turned into the FME zipster lizard. <laughs> so it's yes, a little bit of yes, a mashup there. They've sort of been at cross paths and this is what happens, you know, like, uh, yeah. So, wow, that's yeah. one mean lizard. <laughs> yeah. I got the mountains, right? You got the, it is a robot and there is a lizard in there. So it is yeah, definitely a right. unique image there. That's right. It looks a bit like the Gorn, perhaps Dawn, or else maybe the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, it's, if I saw that lizard coming at me, I don't know what you, I'd be running. <laughs> Awesome. So we'll move on to the last section here. And this is just the in-product AI updates. And this is currently a, pro a prototype that is not publicly available. So um, we will definitely be wanting your feedback on any of these. There will be um, some questions in the survey at the end of uh, in the survey at the end of the webinar. So please stick around for that. Um, we want your feedback. This is going directly to our product management team. This is something that we're seriously considering. Obviously, Don and Dale are very interested in this as well. And your feedback is very important here. So talk about your FME form co-author. And this is gonna be an exclusive look at development that we've been working on uh, for things like AI for, reg for regex, for SQL and Python. Um, we've seen it with a generative AI uh, ability and that's on the package uh, on the FME Hub. So that's already available to you. These things um, hopefully can be available to the public at some point in the near future. Mm -hmm. So we'll first take a look at uh, using AI directly in FME form for regex. So what we're gonna do is go into the regex editor and then we can paste in a description just using natural language for what we actually wanna match for. So in this case, let's actually look for um, any URLs that start with HTTPS or HTTP and we can actually get an explanation and it'll pre-fill the test string and the reg regex expression in those parameters for you. So this is a perfect tool for someone like me where well, in all honesty, whenever I'm doing regex, I'm on Stack Exchange. I'm Googling because I don't know regex. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. this is just a great way to expedite your, your authoring exp experience here. Um, and not only does it fill in what the regex should be, it does give you that explanation. So you can hopefully learn along the way and not have to rely on this um, every single time. The next example that we have here is for SQL. So it can be in any of the SQL parameters. It can be in the inline querier. Uh, you can do uh, any geometry SQL related to it as well. So all of this is fully kind of, I would say integrated in all of the SQL pr prompts that you would see in FME form. Same thing for regex um, and the last one is Python. Anywhere that you would expect to see those uh, parameters pop up, you'll have them in those dialogues. So in this case, we're just gonna get a SQL statement to find all roads that intersect with parks and all parks that intersect with the roads. Um, and it'll provide that SQL for you. And not only does it fill it, it actually runs. So yeah. So in this case, it's a little, a little less dynamic than the regex because obviously regex gives you that test string so you can see what it, uh, what it should be matching as. Um, SQL won't really give you those examples, but again, just helping that workflow, uh, speeding it up for your uh, authoring experience. Yeah, huge, huge accelerator, yeah. yeah. And then the last one we have here is for Python and same thing here, not, not much of a sur surprise, but uh, we have a couple of more, a couple of additional options instead of just generate. So you can actually refine your code. You can have it in integrate some comments into your script so you can uh, help make it easier to maintain. Um, and you can also have it again, explain what is going on in that Python code. So um, hopefully you don't actually have to use Python in any of your form work workspaces, but if you do, you might have a AI assistant here because it's very similar to the SQL or regex um, uh, instances where maybe most of your time you're on Stack Exchange finding out what all of these things mean. Um, hopefully that just expedites your process here. So uh, same thing here. Uh, we've generated the Python script and we'll actually run it. So just to prove that this is actually functional. And this is fully AI uh, created Python. 
And it's just going here. And there we go. And just showing off that uh, it actually completed. I think in that case, it was checking for nulls and then replacing the values with missing values. So nice. yeah, uh, that kind of concludes all of the demos that we had for, for today. So yeah, yeah, we'll get into just some conclusion and resources at this point. Yeah, and really, I mean, this is the point, right? With FME, you can connect any system you have, any data source you have to generative AI. And um, that's really, you know, the power that, F that FME brings. So you can see all these different data sources, all these hundreds and hundreds of systems, and um, you can bring them all to what you've seen today. So, um, and uh, yeah, all with no code. So that's exciting. And then, yeah, if you're new, we have a um, 90 minute way to get started on FME, um, the accelerator, or if you've been using FME, you know, for a long time, we found a lot of people who take the accelerator have been long term FME users who just want to get a really quick overview of the entire platform and all it can do for them. And so there's that. If you're new to spatial data um, and your organization and you want to understand the value that spatial data brings. Um, the other thing that Gartner identified at the conference was spatial data is one of the two data types that organizations must understand to, uh, you know, to be remain competitive with, with geospatial. So, you know, this book is targeted at a very high level, understanding the value of geospatial or spatial data to the, to the enterprise. And um, yeah. And last but not least, lots of webinars, everything's recorded and um, yeah. And Elizabeth is our webinar coordinator. Yeah. Yeah, and more learning um, at SAFE. Everything is free. All this online training is free. Uh, many of them are instructor led, but they're free. Um, and same with the academy, instructor led, and it's free. And so, yeah, sign up. Let us know what you want to do. Um, you know, David Tensing, he also does training as well through his. And then you've seen a lot about the FME Hub. The world today is moving faster and faster than ever, faster than any company can have releases. And so, the beauty of FME Hub is now the FME platform can be extended by, you know, by safe, by partners, you know, by anybody. And in this, this fast moving world of generative AI, um, it really shows the value of the FME platform in its agility with uh, the FME hub. Yeah. And if you're on the community, you get a community badge. And um, if you want to join the community, just click that link. So yeah. And uh, there's some happy safers. Yeah. You want to talk about this one, Dale? Sure. We're headed all to Bonn, Germany. Join us there for the peak of data integration. The FME User Conference promises to be the largest FME UC ever held, September 5th through 7th. Don, I think you're going, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going, Dale. I registered. You and I registered yes yesterday. We yes, we shot an that. exciting video. You won't want to miss that video. Um, That's right. That's right. Our first Anything time in front of the... Go ahead. Sorry. Just, I was just going to say it's our first time in front of a green screen, so we'll see what the team does. That's right. That's right. I'm a little bit worried, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So even if you're not an FME user, the peak of data integration is going to be all the ways that data integration is used to solve new problems. So we, we usually expect 15 to 20% of attendees are not FME users. And, um, and so if you're in Europe, come to Bonn. If you're in North America, come to Bonn. If you're anywhere in the world, Dale, really come to Bonn. It's going to sure. be a lot of, yeah. 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 All right, fantastic. So now we do have some time remaining for Q&A and I'll invite uh, Chris and Dale on the stage here to join me. Lots of fantastic questions this morning. Thank you, everyone. Take a look through here. Well, thanks for tuning in everybody. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun looking at all the ways that, that AI can be used to help workflows. And I guess I'm kind of tipping my hat on something, but we're getting very close now to the release of FME 2023.1. And um, the team, uh, we haven't really shown it. Uh, these, these are prototypes you saw here, but there's some additional uh, refinement been done and we're getting really close. Some of the things that people were liking are gonna, gonna come to life here very soon. So watch for that. You could come to Bonn and actually see us uh, unveil it on stage there. I think Elizabeth, you're gonna be in Bonn, aren't you? No, but I have seen some of the descriptions sound very interesting. So how about you, Chris? Are you going? No, I won't be there, unfortunately. Oh, wow. I'm the only one. The day before. <laughs> You're representing Dale. You're flying solo, Dale. Wow. Okay. Well, you won't see any of them, but I'll be there and uh, Don will be as well. Absolutely. Yeah, there'll be so good safe presentation there. Highlight? Any questions? Yeah, so there were a handful that came through throughout the webinar that were 
Um, very relevant. A couple of people were just wondering about the regex expressions and kind of the in-product updates. So that one, again, those are going to be fully revealed in Bond. So in just two short weeks, I think it is. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's coming up very soon. I think Paul, and... I'll hit the button to start a live answer. Paul was asking about when the dot one release is going to come. It is going to come in September. So I can say that with, with deep certainty. So um, I would even suggest by the middle of September or maybe even while we're in Bonn, if we can pull it off, but it's coming very fast. Awesome. Yeah, and then the other good question that came up was uh, from Tim Hayes. Will this connector work when using FME Form 2021? So this is actually going to apply to any older build of FME. And we say, quote, unquote, older because it's not 23, which is the latest and greatest. Um, any previous build, you can absolutely connect with any of these AI services or any other REST-based services just using the HTTP Caller Transformer. We do have a Getting Started with REST APIs uh, tutorial series that goes through all the basics that you'll need to know from web services to the web connection, all the way to actually making those calls to the endpoints that you're trying to access. So um, yes, you'll have to build those tools yourself, essentially. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to do using that HTTP caller transformer. But uh, if you just put the REST API documentation side by side with your workspace, you can typically figure it out pretty quickly. And you can also download the latest uh, version of FME, like if you have 23, just as like a beta testing, you can actually right click and embed the custom transformer on the canvas, then you can edit it and you'll see all the contents of it. So you can essentially just copy and paste um, what has been done in there. You can't copy the physical transformer from a new build into an older build because that version might not exist, but essentially just keep the parameter dialogues open and kind of copy and paste the values across. I'll take a crack at Lynn's uh, question. Lynn, good to, good to hear from you. Are the in-product updates in the dot one beta? And the answer there is a bit complicated because um, what we're doing, and I'll, I'll tell the audience this, is we ourselves are not embedding the call directly to uh, the Azure OpenAI service. We're going through a web service of our own so that in, in the future we could change to other backends. And that web service I don't think is live yet. So if you grab the 2023.1 beta right now, I do not think that the AI assist stuff will work. It might kind of be there. There's a button at the bottom of the dialogues. Um, but I, I guess we'll say this. I personally haven't seen it function yet. Um, so there, it, it's, um, it's getting very close. But there's, it's actually one of the most complicated things we've done in a long time because we have to have uh, like a service running full time. We're also going to have it so that you can supply your own keys and URLs if you don't want to use ours for that in-product assistance as well. So that's something that I was just talking to the documentation team yesterday that they were busy writing up. So we're getting to the very end of productizing this, but it's um, early days still. You can try a dot one beta. Um, I don't think it's going to work yet, but I think it's going to come to life sometime in the next 14 days. <laughs> awesome. Just looking at any other questions here. I'll um, try Kevin here um, about uh, if you have an idea about how you want to create a workspace, but you don't know how to best build it. We've seen, we've actually had a demo done at, at SAFE of like a little chat tool on the side of your uh, workspace where you say, hey, I'm thinking of finding all the lines that of these roads that intersect parks and are inside. Can you help me how to do this? Uh, give me the FB transformers. And it kind of takes a crack at it. And then what we did in the bottom of that was have some buttons to then place those transformers. And if this is something that you would find interesting, upvote this, um, this question to get a sense of your enthusiasm, but that's the kind of thing. And you can certainly do this. Chris has done it, I know, with just a normal chat GPT and you type in your problem and it will give you suggestions of FME transformers, especially if you say, I'm using FME Workbench. Um, you have to kind of tell it who you are and what you're trying to do, but it does hallucinate. It does. It, it is not afraid to make up transformers that seem very convincing that they're real transformers, but they're not. Um, but that's what we see as, a, as really the true holy grail is um, changing the quick ads so that there would be more um, interactivity to it and more AI there. So that's that's what I'd say about that one. Okay. Excellent. There was another interesting one that came up too from uh, Grace wondering, is it possible to deploy our own LLM or other types of AI models on FME Flow? And I think this one's actually a very interesting question. So Dale, I'd love to see your perspective on it as well. What I kind of thought was, 
as long as you're able to access it from your local machine, depending on how you're accessing it, whether it's REST API or Python, um, that environment should be similar on FV flow. So I don't see why it shouldn't be possible, but Dale, I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts on that are. No, exactly. I mean, it, it, if you have your own LLM going somewhere and you can get at it, then it's going to be just a matter of does your flow, ho the, the, the server that's running your flow, does that have a way to get to that service? And as long as it does, it'll work. And, and I think that's the exploding area. You know, we showed a couple of different services today, but um, every day it seems like there's new ones. I, I saw one yesterday. Uh, somebody's made a, a, a special highly tuned language model just for SQL. Um, so that, that's the case of, of like, not, not probably something that you'd use in a workflow with, uh, with FME, but, but maybe more at authoring time. But nonetheless, I, I, I think the future is going to be that there's going to be lots of these models around and you may have them tuned for your specific situation and want to apply that to data on the way by. And so I think Grace is onto something there that we'll see more of for sure. Let's see. Anything else we should talk about? Yeah, it looks like we've gotten to most questions at this point. Yeah, any other? So, any? I'll, I'll take a crack at Paul Morris's about um, the generative AI reader is using whatever, I think that just uses the open A. Does it use Azure? Or I can't remember, Chris, if it uses Azure or open AI's um, APIs, but nonetheless. Uh, I think that one was the Azure Open API. Yes, I think you're right. So then it comes down to, I think Chris answered this in a previous um, typed answer. It's going to be the, the policies of whatever the, the service you're using, of whether they're going to use your data or not. I think, but don't you know, trust but verify that anything on Azure is not leaky. And I do not think that anything on OpenAI has necessarily the same uh, guarantee, but really your mileage may vary and you really wanna really, really wanna understand that before you start sending your data to these services for sure. Someone's asking about BARD. Um, we're in Canada, eh? And I don't think we can even get BARD here. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, still not yet. So we have to go across to Washington state. We'd have to have run a VPN. Um, or something. So uh, I have to think, like, I, you know, Chris, these are not hard to connect to FME. So once we have access to it, we'll be able to build a, a BARD caller or a BARD or yeah. um, whatever we, what should be the name, do you think? We should get people to chat their favorite name for the <laughs> BARD caller. But um, I thought BARDers are people that gather together and watch things that fly in the air, but uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Final call. If we have any other questions we might want to address here, Chris and Dale, wrapping up. Yeah, I think we're pretty good to wrap up there. Excellent. If you do have any other questions that come up, um, feel free, of course, to email us at infosafe.com. And Dave is more than happy as well to help answer any questions. His email's on the screen there. If you have a brief moment to fill out our webinar survey, we really appreciate any feedback. And a huge thank you to our whole team of presenters, Dave, Don, Dale, and Chris. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. Elizabeth, before we go, um, yeah. we must have a dot one release webinar coming sometime. We do, yep. Yeah. Um, you, he you heard it here first, folks. It's gonna be coming after the peak. So definitely stay tuned for that because we, we will definitely be demoing the in-product uh, AI assistance uh, then. So if you're interested in this sort of stuff, watch out for an email from Elizabeth and her team mm -hmm. and come watch us when we do that, when we release the dot one or come to Germany because you could see it firsthand there. And then I think, who knows, Elizabeth, we may always um, dust off and re-imagine uh, and redo this webinar about AI and FME sometime in the next six, eight months I'm excited to see what customers in Germany might have been doing uh, around the world. And we, if we have some interesting ones there, we'll bring their stories to everybody through this medium. Uh, otherwise, I'm confident that stuff isn't standing still. So this topic is not going away anytime soon. Absolutely. And I actually just dropped the link in the chat to that uh, 23.1 webinar. So check it out and you can register now.
coming September 20th. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, and hope you all have a rest, a fantastic rest of your day. Bye for now.